it's a real honor to be here, you know. I've listened to this man uh, since I was a little kid. You know, I, I grew up in the Bronx, and in the Bronx, uh, primarily there were a lot of instrumental bands, soul bands, horn bands. And Cool and the Gang was the band we all listened to. Um, so uh, you talk about the soundtrack of somebody's life. Uh, this man's music is uh, part of my DNA, so to speak. Um, so without further ado, may I introduce to you Ronald Khalees Bell. I felt like Don Cornelius. <laughs> Khalees wow. Bell. How many times have you been on Soul Train? Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. <laughs> uh, this is one of my first times doing this, but um, Soul Train. Uh, Soul Train started in Chicago. So um, a lot of times it was in Chicago before it got aired in L.A. Uh, about five, six, seven, eight times, I guess. Now, where are you from? Are you from Ohio originally? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. Mm. I was born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio, on 226 North Prospect Street. And uh, I just, rem I could remember, I can remember still the steel mills every night they had, like, when they poured out the steel or something, mm. all the sparks and things used to come up over the hills. We thought it was fireworks, but it was all one color. But that was Youngstown. <laughs> Youngstown was <there. laughs> Until we went to Idor Park, which is a park where they had colored fireworks. <clears throat> sparks. Anyway, um, it was a steel town. And, um, I really loved Youngstown before they just moved the highway through there. There's nothing left. You know, King Records was in Cincinnati. Did you feel compelled to ever go by there and, and, and run into or meet James Brown and, and, or hobnob with the JBs? Was that a dream? Well, not exactly. Um, I was too young, but James Brown came to uh, Idor Park. My mother wanted to see James Brown. I didn't know who James Brown was. Right. I'm going to see James Brown, boy. So she... <laughs> <laughs> James Brown, who's that? <laughs> um... So she went to see James Brown, and later on I found out who James Brown was. <laughs> and my mother really loved James Brown, and, you know, we had a lot of uh, Ray Charles, my aunt. We had a lot of music in Motown and whatnot playing around. But, yeah, uh, later on I found out who James Brown was, you know, when I saw him uh, at, in Jersey City come to Roosevelt uh, Stadium, and I knew who James Brown was, you know, mm. live. You know, I heard his records, but I didn't know it. His performances was like that. Right. Right. And then, you know, they started fighting after it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the way you play the saxophone is, um, it, there, there's like a kind of a Mount Rushmore of, of tenor players that played in this genre. And I hate to use the word genre. Uh, because most musicians, when they play music, they just play music, and then it's up to marketing people to to sell it. So that's where the genre thing comes in. But, um, you know, Maceo Parker, obviously King Curtis uh, is number one, but then Maceo and, and Junior Walker. Those, your solos on these songs, especially early Cool in the Gang, are in that pantheon of greatness. You know, when I grew up listening to your music, I could sing all of your solos. I would sing them. I knew every note. Wow. I can sing them to you now, but you know, we, we don't have that much time. 
and that would be a little frightening for you. But I mean, uh, uh, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, that's how heavy your your playing is. As a, reflect on that. What was the concept there? Um. Well, I think it started with me hearing John Coltrane for the first time. Um, but before that, I was listening to other saxophonists uh, before that. And my mother used to play a lot of uh, Junior Walker. So I got that, King Curtis, you know, and, and you know, that kind of music and all the Motown solos. Right. But one day I went over to my uh, good friend Robert Spike Macon's house, and he had just purchased Love Supreme. And um, he said, you got to listen to this. And so I go and sit in his uh, living room. And he said, you just stay in here by yourself. And he turned, you know, the lights off. And I sat there through the whole uh, album. And when it was finished, I, I, I'd never heard anything like that. And for me, and then I read the liner notes, you know, about what Train wrote, you know, and... Um, I was finished after that. I was chasing train, but never to catch him. I don't right. think. <laughs> right. Nobody. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Coltrane. Hard to catch that train. Yeah, but that 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 was my inspiration from there. I, I listened to a lot of saxophone players, a lot of them. Wayne, Shorter, a lot of them. You know. I'm sure Sonny Rollins is Sonny in there. Sonny Rollins, of course. Um, Archie Shep. I mean, mm -hmm. I was into everybody. Uh, Albert Eiler. Uh, after Train, of course, you know, right. and then Pharaoh Saunders uh, had the pleasure of Pharaoh coming and playing with Lonnie Liston Smith at a coffee house. It used to church uh, in Jersey City called St. John's, and they came and played there. But uh, yeah, it was all Train, and I, I kept reaching and reaching, screaming for Train and Junior Walker on the high note, ah, right. and just trying to emulate those. In, Decided one day it's not going to happen, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but you created your own thing. I got a lot of inspiration from all right. those tenor players and alto right. players too, as well, baritone players. Uh, you know, and um, yeah, they were great inspirations. Right, because it's not easy to do to to to, to play memorable solos. You know, because a lot of people play a lot of gratuitous notes, you know what I mean? The, everything that you play counted. And it still counts because we're, we're playing together uh, now. And, you, yeah. and you're as vital now as you've ever been. I appreciate that. But I got that from my mother. Uh, my mother, I don't know if anyone knows Meditations, John Coltrane's album, Meditations. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that, Meditations. Yeah, yeah. The one where he's leaning back and the, 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 the first song is Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So you're playing it. All you can remember is that soul, the uh, the first m melody. You can hear them. And everything else in the background is like the universe coming together. And uh, he's singing this mantra or playing this mantra. And my mother came home and she said, boy, in the middle of the solo, of course, uh, if you play that record one more time, you <laughs> and that record all are going out the window. She said, throw it out the window. She said, and this is what she told me. She said, um, you better play something that somebody can remember if you really want to do that. Uh -huh. So that's where all these uh -huh. things that say, oh, you might be right about that. Because <laughs> you got to remember, you know, if you don't, well, that, from there I said, well, only thing I could remember, uh, even listening to John Coltrane for the first time, was on Bye Bye Blackbird when my father brought it home when I was like three. And I was, couldn't even see up over the, the record player. I could see it spinning around. And I heard, I just re never forgot Bye Bye Blackbird. And uh, from there on, I said, okay, I better play some nursery rhymes or some things people can remember. Because, you know, that, that meat or that all that information train was given, nobody's ever going to remember that. I remember a lot of it, but, you know, you catch some of those solos yeah, I yeah. Try chasing it, but I, I never got that. But, yeah, that's how I came up with those memorable lines. Play right. something somebody can remember. Now, when you were in Jersey City, um, you know, we were talking one time, you... Uh, 
Jamaluddin Takuma and myself, we were talking about some of those bands that were in that area, in that Philadelphia, Jersey City area. And there was one band that you had mentioned that I had never even heard of. Was it The Invaders? What was the name of that band? Willie Feaster uh -huh. and the Mighty Magnificence. Ah, yes. Featuring Skip, Sonny, and the Pace Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and it had to be about, how many was it? Like 18 of them? I don't know. <laughs> and they all... <laughs> They all had, they were dressed in these suits and bow ties and they were real sharp and the movements and everything. You know, because we were chasing Sly, you know, we can't right. argue with it. It was, and they, they, they really taught us a lesson. So you want to be in this business, you got to entertain. So we were up there playing, trying to chase train. But they taught us show business. And that was the, to me, that was the best band that I heard. Right. You know, as yeah. a band. Right. Because they could really play. Great musicians. Those guys. Right. You know, <clears throat> the early... Cool in a Gang, to me, uh, has about four different periods. And I was such a huge fan of the first period. It's kind of like, uh, you know how there's like uh, like Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac has several different periods. There's like the Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green in England, and, and then there's the Fleetwood Mac with Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. Now, a lot of people don't know about the Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green. Uh, you know, they're, never, they're like, what? You know, they only know from rumors out, all right? So a lot of people may know Cool and the Gang from like JT out, but... They're cool in the gang to me is cool in the gang through uh, Jungle Boogie. Okay, so I'm listening to Cool in the Gang, and you know all of these songs in the beginning, they were full of uh, positive messages, and that was the that was the style of the time. You know, as you say, Chasing Sly Stone, you know, Sly and Family Stone, all of the bands, the horn bands, they all, in that, that particular period of time, especially in this country, you know, we were trying to bring people together and have people uplift the, 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 the public spirit. And you had a lot of that. Um, did you write a lot of the lyrics uh, to those songs as well as the melodies and something? Yeah, I coined a lot of those phrases uh, right. uh, in the beginning. Uh, uh, music is the message. Let the music take your mind. Music is the message that brings yeah, sing, sing, universal sing. love of one, one and all. all. <laughs> all seasons, seasons, winter, winter summer, summer, spring, and, and fall, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's it. it love yeah. the life you live. Bring. Love the life you live. Yeah. Love the so life you can live. You live the life you love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can sing all these songs. I love this period of time. Now, Gene Red was your producer. Yeah. Where did a, Where did you meet Gene Red? How did that come about? Okay. Again, I attribute that to my dear mom. She um, she met a guy named Walter Foster in a in a bar or something, that we used to rehearse, you know, in the back. And she said, you know, my boys can play, you know. He said, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, your boys can play. He said, yeah, they can, you know. And he was the bus driver for James Brown who wanted to make a record. See, I knew James Brown was in here somewhere. <laughs> so she said, yeah, you need, you need to come hear my boys play. So she came, he came to hear us. His name was Walter Foster. So he came and heard us play. He, oh, wow, he got excited. Oh, this guy, you can really play. I want y'all to come and make my record for me. You know, he's, well, I remember the song. Down on my knees, Lord, I got tears in my eyes. Plump, da -da, you know, the whole drama thing. So we did that <laughs> for him. He said, yeah. Now, you know, mind you, we're, you know, this is John Coltrane, Miles Davis, and Cannonball Adley, Elvin Jones, Buddy Rich, Bud Powell, okay, and Bob Cranshaw and Reginald Workman. 
up here, you know, okay, we're going to play this record for you, man. So we did it. And then he said, oh, your sounds great. I, I need you to meet this producer guy, person, Jane, uh, Gene Red. So he said, Gene, come on down, listen to these kids, you know. We, I was only 16 then, I think, yeah. And um, so uh, he came down and listened to us. Yeah, he, he could play. You know. <laughs> I, well, he played it off. I mean, by that time, we had the whole Jersey City scene. You know, we, we, we were the Soul Town band, wanting to be like Motown. So we got most of our muscle playing Motown music behind all these acts from 9 to 2 in the morning and trying to go to first class math and remember that and and you know they said i saw you in the kenya club last night boy <laughs> 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 yeah we were in the kenny club and um we got our muscle from there so he he sort of took us under after he heard us play he took an interest in us and i think george wanted to go over his house and really talk him into doing it. But I think he already had it in his mind what he wanted to do with us. So he took us in the studio for six months. No, he rehearsed us for six months, and then he took us in the studio. And he cleaned up what we, you know, we, 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 we play head charts, you know. It was all creative for us. Uh, I call it the collective genius with a, quick, with a K. Collective genius of a band called Cool and the Gang. Because that, that's who we were. I mean, we came together with all this energy, wanting to be like those before us. And he saw that in us, and he took us and rehearsed us for six months, it was. And uh, we came up with that first record with Gene. And Gene, I think, was a genius myself. I think he was a genius. He taught me a lot. Yeah, I mean, those, those records were <clears throat> amazing. Um, now... Here's, here's another thing that growing up in the neighborhood, we're all asking questions, and we're going to go, well, <clears throat> so we say, like, okay, well, Ronald, your name at the time was Ronald. <clears throat> um, Ronnie. Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie seems like the leader of the band. Why isn't his name cool? Um, how, how's oh, you want to answer that question? <laughs> so, so your brother... Robert is cool. Oh, he's so, definitely cool. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he's definitely cool. But so, cool in the gang. Who came up with the name? Who? Well, how did this happen? Where it seems like you're the lead of the band, but the you know you yeah, know, my name you know is what Mickey I'm getting Mouse. at. Yeah, it was. Like... <laughs> <laughs> how did that happen? No. Uh, okay, this is how that all came to being. Um, to hear tell it, uh, each one of us will tell you that we have an equal part in all this. And we do. But I think, well, I know for a fact, I'm going to tell you now that I was the one that, who sort of like got everybody together. You want to start a band? You want to And kept it going. So by the time we got to Gene Red, and my brother was always cool. His name was Tamango before it was cool. So there's a real side of this is like a gang is it was it's real there's a real gang side to cool in the gang <laughs> no no for real there is there's a history be you know running the streets and whatnot so you had a choice you either gang banged or you made music and i was a nerd so i wasn't going to do that and um my brother was out there that's how i got protection to walk through the streets with my horn without it getting taken and he had to um he had to uh, join this gang so that he could get some protection. And there was like 25 of them or 40 of them, and he became the leader. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Uh, the, the, the shortest guy always becomes the leader. Have you noticed that? No, they were all short. In sure. life. <clears throat> they all had you Napoleon know. complex. They were yeah, short. yeah, yeah, that Napoleon thing. Yeah. But they were all short. But let me tell you a story how Cool and the Gang came about. Okay. Gene Red looked at us, you know, he's objectively studying us and said, okay, he knew exactly who each one of us were. And he asked us this question one day about, uh, what do you want to do if you are successful in this business? And, you know, what do you want to do with your money or whatever? Uh, and I just said, I just want to make music. And I'm still like that today. But he looked at everybody. 
He said, okay, you guys need to come up with a name. Because we had Cool in the Flames again, and we couldn't use the Flames because of James Brown. See James Brown again. Yeah, he's responsible. <laughs> and um, so he looked at us and said, okay, you guys come back tomorrow and come up with a name. So we all went home, came back the next day, and he said, did you come up with a name? He looked at everybody, looked at him, he said, no. He said, well, I got a name for you. <laughs> Cool in the gang. <laughs> now, 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 you know, all, the, rest of us, like, the rest of us were like, okay. If anybody had a problem with that name, they should have said something then. <laughs> but the name was so cool, nobody had a problem with it. I, still, I don't have a problem with it. It's one of the best names Yeah, that's ever. like, what, it's going to be Ronald in the gang? Honestly. <laughs> Is that going to work? <laughs> George in the gang? <clears throat> Ricky in the gang? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because it's like that thing where, like, uh, say, Dave, the Dave Clark Five, for instance. Dave Clark was the drummer, but he wasn't the singer, but it was his band. You know, so, like, Paul Revere and the Raiders. Mark Lindsay was the lead singer, but Paul Revere was the piano player. But, you know... Mm. Spencer Davis group, but Stevie Winwood was doing all the plays. So that's so when you're a kid, you're trying to figure out well who's the leader of the band, and you see Cool, but Cool is a bass player. But it's obvious that you're the leader of the band. That's where the that's where the thing was. That we're trying to figure it out. But <clears throat> I could tell you that when I started to play the bass, I was self-taught bass player. That the thing that I did was learn Cool and the gang bass lines. All right. Because the bass line was the hook of the tune, and it was great because everything was in the key of E. <laughs> so it, all you had to do was boom, ding, 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 boom, you know, like, and it was like, boom, and every song, and it was fantastic. That was, that was it. And that, so it was like, well, that's cool. That's cool. That's and, cool. And that's Robert Cool Bell. That's how he got it. That's fantastic. First time he picked up the bass, it was on an E string in Cafe Wa. We needed a bass player, and I asked him, I said, uh, why don't you come play with us tonight instead of going out there with your boys? <laughs> he came, and we asked the bass player to borrow his bass. I said, can we borrow your bass? And I said, no, bro, just hit the E string. Boom, 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 boom. And we started playing Coming Home Baby by Ben Tucker. <laughs> and that's the first time he played a bass. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's amazing. That's incredible. Holy yep. cow. Yep. That's wow. That's anybody know that song? You know that song. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Coming home, baby. There you go. Yeah. But yeah. Boom, boom. That's it. End of story. So now we're 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 working through Cooling Gang, I, you know, I remember buying, you know, first of all, all your records. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Live at the Sex Machine. This is a soul, soul vibration. Mm, 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 mm. Soul vibration. Okay, that was a stop. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I love all the records. Uh, 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 you know, Music is a message, obviously, all that stuff. Then we get to a period where funky stuff. Oh, boy. Hello? <laughs> funky stuff. Okay. Mm, hit me. <laughs> <clears throat> um, funky stuff. Okay, record company says you guys have to come up with a hit record. And they wanted to call Gene back in to do Soul Makusa. Yeah, Ma Mamu the Bango. Yeah. Come on, people. You know, that was a hot record, man. So Makosa. Mama, 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 Mama,
you know, because they cut that at Atlantic yeah. on Atlantic Records. There, there was another version. Oh, yeah, he yeah, did two right. versions. Yeah. Anyway, that's trivia. Yeah. And you know, Frankie was banging that record. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We're gonna do Soul Makusa. You know, I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and we out here, you know, doing that Good Times album. You know, the orchestra history. We trying Good to do something great. Good Times on my mind. All of that. Well, it's here style. and it's summer time. Okay, good. Anyway, <laughs> you guys got to come up with a hit. After all, this is a business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's that. You know, also, you know, Mr. V, um, can you, you know. Gene, so Makusa. I said, no, 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 we're not doing so. We're not going to do that. No, we're going to come up with our own so Makusa. That's what we're going to do. Well, I, what I said, we all come up with our own jungle music. I didn't mean it like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, after you listen to. <laughs> we listening to. Okay, you know, Creator has a master plan, and, you know, all this music, this high minded music, and, you know, it's all body. Do, 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 do. It was grooving, though, I can't deny. But. Okay, we're going to make up, we're going to do this commercial thing because we already knew how to do it because we were introduced to it through Motown. Uh, so, okay, we can come with that music. We can do that. Yeah, on your first record, actually, Cool Again, you did a version of Since I yeah, Lost, Since my, I lost baby. my Baby. Yeah, yes. which was wild, you know, yeah. doing the Temptations tune oh, as, mm -hmm. an yeah, as an instrumental. Kind of wild. That was Gene's idea uh -huh. again. So they thought they'd bring Gene back to do that. But no, we said, no, we're going to do this and we can do that. So we... We go home the next day. We set up a rehearsal at Baggies. You remember Baggies downtown? Mm. Okay. So Charles walks in, guitarist Charles Clayton Smith. He said, the first thing he said, I got something. So he starts playing this riff. The first thing you hear on more funky stuff. <laughs> he starts playing that, and everybody nods. He said, oh, you know, that is monkey. <laughs> And then George just start. Yeah, when he says George, just so you know who George is, George, Funky George Brown, is one of the funkiest drummers ever to be put on the face of the planet Earth, and uh, yes. a big inspiration to me, and uh, very uh, underrated. You don't hear enough talk about his greatness, but he um, he put a stamp on this music, for yeah, sure. We did. The most sampled uh, band, that loop that you hear, that... that they use in hip-hop now. Yeah, George came in and he started playing that awkward beat, that funny beat. Mm -hmm. And then everybody started chiming in. And, you know, I started singing Down by the Riverside. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and I... Ba -ba -da 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 -da. Da, 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 da. Couldn't oh, do that because that was. That. A, so look at that. Woo. Look at that. Whoa. It gets deeper. Whoa. No, it gets wow. deeper. So, you know, I'm in church with that. Yeah, it's down by the riverside because I really loved Oliver Nelson, you know, live at the, uh, the you know, uh, LA, was it? With Tom Scott. You know, down by the riverside. Da, da, da. That big band down by the riverside. So I just took a little bit of that. And I went da 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 comes from Charles going bing da 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 is like I'm trying to get this whole cold train thing, you know, on acknowledgement, you know, the first part of acknowledgement when it goes. Da -da 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 -da. I'm making an announcement here. Right. And that whistle just happened to be in the bag. So Dennis picks up Dennis DT Thomas is the alto saxophone player. Also a great percussionist. A great percussionist. He picks up the whistle. <laughs> we stuck the whistle on the front of the record. 
I mean, this is all mindless stuff we were doing. You know, and I just started saying, can't get enough <laughs> of that funky stuff. And every time I try, I say, whoa, whoa, yeah, get down. <laughs> one take. That record is one take. Woo, hit me. Oh, oh, One take. Oh. One take. It pushed sounded it, like such a party. It pushed it aside, pushed it to the side. And when, when I was producing it, I said, okay, what are we going to do for the B side? I said, <laughs> more, more funky, funky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Started it with the guitar, you know, because that guitar lick is and just then, but unbelievable. And then Clayton plays it. Then he starts that. Oh, yeah, that's James Brown. Brown. Just ring it. Just keep oh, it ringing. Just keep it ringing. Oh. I, just I learned. Chatting. I learned when I started playing guitar. That's the first thing I learned. <laughs> okay, now I got the yeah. boom, boom, boom. Got... All right, yeah. I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. And just start yeah. chatting, funky stuff, mm. funky stuff, doing the do, you know, mm. uh, doing the do. And uh, most of that, those are edits that Gene taught me how to do the edit. That edit one part to the next mm. and the record became more funky stuff. Now. Jungle, jungle music or jungle boogie. Okay, so okay, here. So now, but 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 check this out. So so now you have this hit, right? And now, if you're a kid and you're chronicling your favorite band, you're going, oh, they're becoming more and more successful. This is fantastic. This is great. This is great. Then, jungle boogie and Hollywood swinging come along, and now you're now you're now you're breaking the top twenty pop top twenty now, and now we feel. You feel the escalation of your favorite band now becoming very popular, and you're going, "Wow, you're pulling, you're pulling for your band." Well, all three of those songs were made up that morning. Really? Yeah. What? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, what? He said, "I got another one." He started playing. Charles Smith, guitar player, started playing. If you listen to Hollywood Swinging, you'll hear the guitar part by itself. It goes, That's the first thing you play. They go, yeah, it's hot, man. And I said, oh, I got a bass line for that. So I, told, I picked the bass up and started playing. Boom, boom, boom. Doom, 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 doom. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, hey, hey. And they said, hey, what you got to say? Ah. Uh, Frankie Crocker was Hollywood Frankie Crocker. So we said, Hollywood. They all Frankie in there. Yeah, Frankie. Mm -hmm. Hollywood swinging. And on the front of that, now, you know, on the front of that, because we used to put this up, well, let's put a signature on the front. <laughs> so it was just da 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 can't get copyright infringement. Da 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 Bum 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 Marsh. The marching band. Marching band. Mar that, that's oh. what that was. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's what that was. Now, Jungle Boogie mm. is the Soul Makusa answer. Right. So I'm listening to Edgar Wonder. Frankenstein. You know, I said, man, that's a nice record. <laughs> yeah, so I said, hmm. And that's how Jungle Boogie came. And he said, well, what, what are you going to put on top of it? There's more to the story. I hope you don't become bored. But it's very interesting. So I go home. I said, man, you got to put something on the top of that because we're, we're under pressure here. You know, you got to come up with a jungle. You got to come up with something better than Soul Makusa. So I start singing Jungle Boogie Boogie Woogie Jungle Boogie Boogie Jungle Boogie Boogie Woogie So I got in the studio, okay, here, here's the hook to the song. So that was the hook first. 
And I said, no, it's all wrong. It's just jungle boogie. Jungle boogie. Jungle boogie. Right? So you know uh, Soul Finger, right? Run, run, dun, 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 run, run, so. <laughs> See it? You hear it? Run, run, dun, 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 dun. run, run. Okay, that's how all that came together with that. Dun, 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 dun. So our roadie, well, our road technician, <laughs> much respect to those who put this thing together. It's not just us. He says, Hey man, you know, you know that track you got? That the one with Tarzan on the end. I even stuck Tarzan on the end. Say, so here's your jungle rug. Oh, 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 boy. I mean, cause this is a joke to us. It was. <laughs> Honestly, the whole thing was a joke. It was, well, we took it as a joke. Oh, we're gonna make some. Commercial music now. Here we go with this. Okay. And he said, I got something for that. That's what you got, Don. He said, I got something for that. He walks in the studio. This is one take. All this stuff is one take. We put on the track. Jungle boy, get up. Put the kit down. Jungle. Woo, boogie, boogie. Woo. <laughs> 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 <Jeeba. laughs> Shake it around. What? <laughs> oh, wow. What? And then the second time around, so we broke in the breakdown, and he started doing that sort of rap, you know. Hey, yeah. huh, get, down. Get, get, down. Huh, get down with the book. I said, who? Huh, get down. I said, who? Huh, get down. Huh, who? Huh, okay, nobody knew. I mean. <laughs> and that record went to number one for us. It, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's like, really? Amazing. So you now you know we're chasing that now. Those three records we chasing. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You're screwed now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Got to make that forever. Right. Right. And so Incredible. that's what happened. Nobody knew. I didn't know. I saw you play that the first time my parents let me uh, out of the Bronx into Manhattan without their uh, guidance, parental guidance. <laughs> when my friends, we went to see. The Jackson 5 at Madison Square Garden, wow. and opening was Cool in the Gang. I was like, I'm going to see Cool in the Gang, and just Jackson 5 is going to be there too. <laughs> and it was incredible. I'll never forget seeing that. And you played all of those hits. And that's when we knew our band had made it. You know, it was like, wow, that's it. You know, we, you know from following from the first album all the way, and now you're at Madison Square Garden with Jackson 5. Jackson Incredible. 5. Unbelievable. I'll never forget that gig. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> so that's that's my favorite cooling game. Then uh, some time passes. And then all of a sudden there's a lead singer named JT. Now, the only JT I know is a friend of mine, James Taylor. So, and then this guy was named James Taylor. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on, time out. Yeah, so J JT. So JT, all of a sudden, you have a lead singer mm. and during the disco era. And then, the, on top of all that, I see the producer is Diodato. And I'm like, Diodato? Cool in the gang with Diodato and a lead singer? What? Ow! What's going on? What's happening to my band? It's like, what happened to... Look what they've done to my song, mom. All right, so what, but then you have this string of hits. And now everybody knows who Cool in the Gang is, but this is like my Fleetwood Mac analogy, you know, like the blues Fleetwood Mac and now the rumors Fleetwood Mac. So now this is the, the rumors Cool in the Gang, you know. So tell me about this the, getting... Somebody told you you needed a lead singer or something? What, what, I guess that was the yeah. next step, right? Guess, yeah, yeah, we were on a show with the Jacksons again. And um, and Dick Griffey uh, out in California said, uh, you guys need a singer. 
a singer. <laughs> he said, yeah, you need a lead singer. You know, you need somebody to sing this, to sing and out in front. Because, you know, by that time, you had Lionel Richie, the Commodores, and right. a lot of bands had singers. We didn't have any. Uh, we were, the horns were our singers, you know. It's funny because he was talking about Lionel. You know, Lionel was a tenor player before he came out front. Yeah, he sure and, was. And Brickhouse was sung by the drummer. The drummer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, right. But then yeah. when they decided to put Lionel up front, then it changes the whole dynamic of the Commodores. Right, it did. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that was the going thing after disco, you know, and the Open Sesame thing and all that. But, uh, yeah, so... You guys in the record company approach us again. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys need another hit. <laughs> now, look, but before we get to that, I, you know, you reminded me of some of Open Sesame. Now, of course, you had all the success with the Saturday Night Fever and all this. Yeah, so the checks must have been rolling in. You're a very rich man. No, the checks were going like this, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, that's that's what that was, you know. Yeah, and then Alan Grubman, good friend of um, the company. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you know, when you figure out this is a business, you're gonna make some money. It's okay. Had to figure that out. Yeah, hold on. Let, you don't want to get I deep in that. You want. I want to know about how to be successful in the music industry. <laughs> um, now, now, explain just a, just explain a little bit of, about that, like because that so because I know people who had songs on that Saturday Night Live Fever album that became millionaires like off of one song, right? And you had one song on there. So what was the story? What happened there? Okay. When you guys figure out that this is a business, then you're going to make some money. And I got a deal here for you. Oh, yeah, we needed the money. So, you know, we had families. I had, you know, <laughs> got a lot of kids. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Honestly, I do. With me and my wife, Tia, we are not, not, well, it's my third marriage, but I have a lot of kids. Seven girls and three boys and, but anyway, there was a lot of children. Not to get off onto that, but we needed the money. You had to pay the rent. You got to keep the lights on. You got to feed the children. So we had to take the deal. Uh, we took the deal not knowing that that's what that was going to be. We weren't told the whole story. Right. At least we got more than a Cadillac. Right. You know? It wasn't like chess records. Yeah, right? it wasn't yeah. like chess. Right. So, I mean, it was just the same as far as I'm concerned. You know? Right. But uh, we had to learn not to do bad deals. Right. And um, that's what happened with that. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I still retain my writing. Right. And uh, uh, publishing on the recapture thing. But, yeah, that, that deal was bad. The other deal bad was the Summer Madness deal. That was the first one. in Rocky, you know, where he goes, put the record on top. And Summer Madness is in that. That's right. the first time they came with that. And, um, well, you know, him with the mob, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> take the deal. I mean, that's the record business. It's, it's very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow... Nobody, nobody really escapes the, the saga of the bad no, deal. It doesn't matter who you are, how big you are. It doesn't matter who you are. It, everybody has to go through it at least once, probably twice. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. So don't feel bad. No, I don't, but yeah. I do, but I don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think about those checks going, <laughs> wow, really? And those opportunities come once in a lifetime, you know. Um, still, I didn't do too bad on that. Right. But uh, it, it would have been you better. you got the writers. Yeah, yeah right. I had the writers. And, right. And, sharing it with the guys and but yeah right so that that period and then comes the jt period uh, you were talking about um how we needed <laughs> you guys gotta come up with another hit man right that's the story you know it's just a business so it was pinpoint focus when we went to a, a record store um promotion and nobody showed up except for this one girl in Jersey City at the square, General Square. 
And she said, cool in the gang. <laughs> she said, oh, cool in the gang's old hat. I took that personal. Right. Oh, hat. No, 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 no. And then it was a pinpoint focus at that point for us to take it to the next level. Right. So we're going to pop music all the way. We're going to pop goes the weasel. And that was the focus. I remember I was totally focused. Okay, I'm taking all these jazz chords out the music and we're going pop. And that was our focus. And we met um, James J.T. Taylor in Jersey. House of Music, uh, through great someone. Great studio, there. by the way. Yeah, great studio. Uh, a <clears throat> man named Charlie Conrad. Charlie and Irene Conrad had a wonderful studio out there. Meatloaf recorded Bat Out of Hell out there. I did some of my very first sessions out there. Learned a lot of recording from Charlie Conrad. I learned about engineering, everything. It was it was a, one of the best studios in the world. And that's when we first met. That's when we first met. Yeah. Yeah. So, in uh, got to get an interview a singer, so... You know, okay, here we go with this. How is this going to work out? So, oh, we got somebody. May, this this guy can really sing. Come in and listen to him. So we're going to interview all these people. So the first guy walks in is James J.T. Taylor. So I said, um, sing this note. He sang that note. Uh, I said, well, sing this note. Uh, sing this note. He said, can sing that note. Now sing this one. All uh, right. I said, okay, he can sing. <laughs> For me, if he can sing the notes, and I heard it in his voice that he sounds like Nat King Cole, really. He really does. Um, back then, I don't know if his voice is still in that form, but his voice is a baritone, you know. Like, if you listen to him on Too Hot or you know, that song um, uh, Got You In My Life, you can hear that in his voice, how rich... And he was a school teacher, so his diction was perfect. And Diodato came in as the referee, because we were about to, you know, we overproduced records at the end of the, <laughs> that period. And then Dio came in and straightened all that out for us. Plus, Dio's a great arranger anyway. You know? And he, he worked that out. And uh, Cool comes in one day. I'm sitting at the piano trying to find this next hit. He walks in. He said, okay, I got two things for you. He said, hang it out. I said, oh, yeah, everybody's hanging out right about now because it was the disco era. And he said, ladies' night. I said, oh. When he said ladies' night, it was like this explosion went off in my head. I said, wow, there's one of those everywhere in the world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> why, would not that, that, why wouldn't that work? Right. And Ladies Night and James and it all came together and the company wanting another hit and we wanting a remake and we're not old hat anymore. <laughs> it all came together. And for seven years, that thing went straight through. Yeah, you had a string. You had Joanna, uh, Ladies Night. Yeah, too hot. Too hot. Get down on it. Yeah. Celebration. celebration. Let's talk about celebration. Fresh. Everybody, celebration. Celebration. Uh, celebration was a gift from the Creator. Um, I was reading a scripture where it says that the Creator gathered all the angels together, and he said, I'm, I'm about to make a human being. Nobody know what that is, He's not because nobody ever seen one. And he said, and after I made this human, I want you all to be subservient to him. And he said, we don't know anything, we just celebrate your praises. And that word stuck out in my head, like celebration, that's big. Everybody's celebrating something. You know, it's the same continuing from Ladies' Night, because on the end of Ladies' Night, you hear, come on, let's all celebrate. You hear, okay. So celebration came at that point. I said, well, there's one of those everywhere, too. Right? Happy birthday to you. So it's a, everybody's having a celebration. And that's how celebration came about. Of course, listening to Prince. <laughs> I was listening to Prince, Donna Summer. And, well, you know, if you listen to, I want to be your tunt. 
right? So I took that, turned it around. <laughs> and you know, and I didn't particularly like that guitar. And Jackson comes in again. That dance, 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 dance. I didn't like that guitar on there, because Dio had put a whole orchestra on Celebration, and he took it all off. He had forty pieces in there, and he took all of them. He took it all off. I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Ah." Uh, it's not working. I said, that's not working? <laughs> he said, no, it's not working. He said, well, are you sure? He said, I ought to be right. I, I wrote over a thousand arrangements. And then I just backed up. I said, wow, you, okay. But I didn't like it. But, um, but whoa, everybody what do I know? Else did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody else did. Now, but, Amir uh, Diodato, just in case you, you, you don't know who he was, um, a great arranger, and and during the CTI, the uh, uh, Creed Taylor uh, record uh, label, he had a very big uh, uh, record, um, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. He did a version of that. And, um, you know, during the radio stations like WRVR and stuff like that, when there was jazz, before Smooth Jazz... There were, there were radio stations that actually played jazz and crossover type things, and this this song actually crossed over his arrangement. So that's how everybody learned about Diodato through this version of 2001 Space Odyssey that he did, mm -hmm. which was great. Billy Cobham played drums on it. It was yeah. a fantastic yeah. recording. And so that's what was so shocking <clears throat> for me now, to see him producing Cool in the Gang, I said, what is Diodato doing with Cool in the Gang? And, and you know, because it just didn't seem to... But the records were so well produced. I mean, they sounded fantastic. And um, who engineered those records? Did Charlie Conrad engineer those? Who, who engineered those? Jim Bonifon. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was right. primarily there. Jim right. was there. Right. right, Jim, yeah. Great engineer. Dio's a great, he, Dio was a great referee for us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, you know, like you said, seven years of this amazing run that now I know you're making money. <laughs> <coughs> and, you can uh, tell by my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of, and then, and then, uh, then hip hop, comes into play and you start getting sampled. Now, you are now the band is everywhere, whether it's just one measure or a loop of four bars or whatever. Um, when did you, did you have to chase your money or did you, how did you do the, because you know, in the beginning, you know, they weren't really required to actually to report. I mean, they people were getting away with murder. Yes, they were. Um, and um, so um, how did that process uh, go for you? Did you have to be a detective and stuff? Do you have to sick the dogs on them first? Or were people straight up? Or how, did, how did that go down? No, I remember hearing Tribe uh, called Quest. And I heard this solo on there. I said, wait a minute. That's me. I'm like, me. <laughs> what? What? And then, you know, Eric B. Rakim, you know, with the, uh, Give It Up. I said, that's us on that record, you know. And then, you know, Public Enemy. And then it, and then it, it got to a point where somebody got mad. What, Bismarck -y? Uh, alone again naturally or something mm. on his right. song and that's when it became law and that's when everybody well you got two years retro to that and then going forward then they start paying but there's a lot of sa then they started sampling samples on top of the samples right. you can't even find those I mean we got over a thousand samples that we're still policing right. trying to find trying to get the money but you know that's what that is but, you know, we stayed, uh, the light stayed on. 
<laughs> Still on. From a lot of those records. Um, it's amazing. Uh, I really, I, I like hip hop. I love hip hop because it, first time I heard Public Enemy, it sounded like John Coltrane to me or something. I love Public Enemy. Yeah. I love Public Enemy. That's when I really. Chuck D. Yeah, it's Incredible. Hip hop. Still vital to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have so many more questions. I don't want to hog. I don't know how much time we have left, but there are some questions from the audience. Now, just <clears throat> let me just warn you: we had to truncate some of these questions because um, because they were a little long. Some of them were illegible, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, but this is from Louis. And uh, he or she wants to know, how would you suggest one go about getting work out to others in the industry? I was told this morning not to, because uh, I, I speak like shorthand, you know, <laughs> it's like real quick. Oh, man, we, this is 2018. Um, the Internet now is it's the way to go. I wouldn't suggest, unless you have somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, to go up into a record company and try to get a budget to do this when you can do it on your laptop. But, uh, yeah, it would be the Internet. So you just upload your stuff to the Internet and, uh, you know, pay a little bit, <laughs> Facebook or whatever, and, and somebody, will, it might go viral, you know. Unless you go get a high-powered manager that's already connected. Right. <laughs> Maybe he can get you a deal. I don't know. It's so different now. It's not. It's like upside down backwards now. It's not the same thing it was when we grew up. But you can get a lot of traction on the Internet. I, I would suggest the Internet. Okay, this is from Sheila. After being at the top of your field, do you still collaborate with others not so famous? Yeah, he's working with me. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> no. Famous, not so famous, not so famous. Again, uh, um, yes, I do. There's a young man who happens to be my wife's Godson, who's I think he's like Picasso in the music. He'll, he'll be coming up. His name's Trey. Uh, yeah, I, I find talent that inspires me, and he and he has inspired me to just go all in on on his art. So yes, I do find uh, a lot of the young artists I find uh, inspiring and want to help them. Like the Fugees, rang the door. I want you to help us, man. Yeah, what you do? He said, well, you rap. <laughs> so, prize well it was. And I listened to him, and Lauren was going to school, uh, Hill was going to school with my daughter, and the rest is history for that. Yeah, nice. I don't think a lot of people know your involvement with that. Uh, well, it's not because of me, of course, you know that. It's just because that's the way it's written. I mean... People show up in your life for that reason, and you're supposed to make the, connect the dots. And the talent is there. I mean, there's a million talented people on this planet. That's true. More than a million. <laughs> so maybe a million we know about because of the Internet. But, yeah, I find people to help, you know, if they inspired me to help them. Okay, this Did is uh, from Markeisha Inslee. This is for the both of us. What skills have uh, you found most valuable in sustaining a long career in the music business? Uh, first of all, you got to love it, number one, with a passion beyond anything else. And if you're with, like I was blessed to be with the seven collective geniuses, is to stay together. The only thing that happened to us so far is that they've passed away. And the four of us are still, we still genuinely are brothers. 
And that's the one thing that my mother said to all of our mothers said to us, just stick together, boys. Don't don't break up. And we still fighting. But we have <laughs> we have a moderator who happens to be my a mediator. An intervener who helps us stay together. So we throw all the darts at him. And when we see each other, we embrace each other, we love each other. Let's go further. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, yo, man, I'm not, I'm not doing this no more. <laughs> but you got to make another record. Why? Because <laughs> the record company said, you got to make another record. And it's never been about money for me, so it, that's why Alan said, yeah, it was... <laughs> The minute you figure out this is a business, you're gonna make some money. But uh, you know, money's a part of it. It just keeps you making stuff, you know. Keeps you funky stuff. Keep you making funky stuff. Not that nobody'll listen. <laughs> I got over a thousand songs now, nobody ever heard. <laughs> right. I Maybe think one day. I think the uh the main thing is to, as you say, love what you're doing. Uh, you really have to have a passion for it and, and also trust in yourself. Uh, there's a certain amount of, um, even though you, you may have self-doubt, there's a certain amount of like confidence, constructive ego that you need to keep forging. Yeah, I agree. Um, and the love for, for music, the pure love for music, and that means, um, you know, one, you know, you're doing your thing and, hey, you might not be in vogue for a couple of years. Who knows? And then all of a sudden, you're, you're, yeah, you're yeah. hot all over again and you haven't changed a thing. That's, you're that's the same true. person. Like, well, you like me this week, but I'm doing the same thing last week. <laughs> but you kept going because you believed in what you were doing. And I think that's what sustains... That gives you the longevity um, to just love what you're doing. That's why the funny thing about all these samples um, is that most of the music that you hear today, the, the samples, that we recorded 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. That's true. You know? And it's wild, you know? And that that tells you right there. Well, if you if you know if you believe in what you're doing and you love what you're doing, it will never go out of style. You have to stay in it. Yeah. You know. Love and music. the other thing that I've um, you know we touched on it earlier about these genres. You know, genres are that's where the business comes in to sell your product. I know that I when I'm playing, I play the same way with my band, The Verbs, as I play with Sonny Rollins, as I, as I play with John Mayer, as I play with Keith Richards, as I play with Bob Dylan, whoever, I'm, I play the same way. I start from here, you know, and then sometimes it connects to here, and uh, sometimes, <laughs> and, and, but it's the, it's the passion, the love for the groove, the thing is, because everything's got a groove, it doesn't matter what genre, and if it doesn't move you, it's not going to move anybody, okay? Fact. And that's the, that is the common denominator of the music that, we're all, that we all love. It moves you. So you have to be playing something that moves you to move other people. And that will keep you happening, sustain a career. In the groove. Keep it in the pocket. I don't know. Uh, this is from Xavier. How do you know when you've uh, made a hit? Do you know beforehand, or are you surprised? <laughs> are you as surprised as everybody else when it gets out there? In my own little world, Xavier, yeah? mm -hmm. it's a hit to me. <laughs> <laughs> In the living room, when I first hear it, yeah, it's a big. This is this is great. And if one person says they like it. I'm done. For me. Now, a hit meaning, if is it going to sell through? Uh, that's a whole nother right. story. Uh, 
with promotion and money and this and that and the other. But uh, Kenny Gamble told me, uh, Luke Mon, Kenny Gamble, in it, uh, Philly International, yeah. who wrote all those great songs. Great Gamble and Huff team. Gamble and Huff team. He said, Cutlies, man, that, that stuff sounds good, man. You could do that in any studio. He said, but I know one thing. Because I wanted, you know, it's Kenny Gamble. <laughs> what you got, Kenny? He said, the world loves a good song. And that, right. that's it. The world loves a good song. So if you think you got a good song, then you got to get it to the world so they can hear it. And it's a whole lot easier now than it was back then. Because all you got to do is put it up on the internet and share it. Just to test market it. Just to see if people like it. I'm not talking about the people who are like, oh, that yeah, sounds great, man. I like you. No, give us an honest answer. Do you really like this song? And they'll tell you. And then from there, you got to feed it. <laughs> you got to feed it. Yeah, feed it. Yeah, feed it. Feed it. <laughs> feed it. It's like, your baby. It's my baby, man. This is a hit. Feed it. Feed it. And after you two houses later, you're still feeding it. <laughs> and you say, oh, this is a hit. Okay. <laughs> and now I just say, yes, yeah, I like it. It's a hit. <laughs> one person likes it. Okay, it's a hit. Go on to the next one. <laughs> yeah, the, the song uh, analogy is, is really the thing. I know when artists come to me and they would like me to produce something or whatever and you know you can see that there's talent you can hear that there's talent and everything but it's all in the songs so you can be as talented as all get out but if you're not singing good songs or recording or playing good songs whatever uh nothing's gonna happen that's true and yeah they have to remember it like my mother said look boy <laughs> play something somebody gonna remember <clears throat> yeah and you know, play organ, grind, just swing, you know, something like that. Like Mary Had a Little Lamb, you know. You remember that. <laughs> Those songs that people remember, it's got to go in and stay in. It can't go in and come out because you, you won't remember it. So that's what I've learned about hit records. If people can remember it and you can retain it, uh, I guess it'll stick in their heads forever. I kick it as well. Isn't it incredible how people butcher the Star Spangled Banner? Speaking of songs, I mean that's a that's a gig you never want to take. I don't know why I got onto that, but you're talking about songs. <laughs> but you know, when people they get a gig, you know, like some of your manager will call you and say, you know, you're gonna sing the Star Spangled. You got a slot to the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. and they they go, yeah, okay, because everybody's gonna see you. Everyone's gonna see you screw up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Some gigs you shouldn't take. <clears throat> Singing That's the Star Spangled Banner is one of them. The, you know, the, don't take that gig. You know, I'm just, just a word of advice out there. Anybody get that gig, get, get that call, don't take that gig. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, S Stephanie Biddle uh, wants to know, Mr. Bell, have you been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet? If yes or no, what took so long? You guys are the best. Jungle Boogie. Are you in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? You don't know? No, last time I checked, no. Okay, I'm going to make that happen. Okay. I appreciate that. Make that happen. That is my crusade to get cool in the gang in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Because that's crazy. That's crazy. And we got people in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, don't get me started. Hold on. Yeah. Wait, wait. Don't. Do not yeah, get that. me started on say, uh, that <laughs> okay um where are we we uh, we're out of time we having too much fun we have too much fun all right well look this has been unbelievable to talk to my friend here my hero really appreciate ronald calise bell you are the man you the man and uh it's been a real pleasure well, I really appreciate it. Um, next time I won't be so afraid to do this. <laughs>
<laughs> what am I going to say? They're just going to talk to you, man. <laughs> That's all. But I never go outside. <laughs> it's because you keep writing them hits. <clears throat> That's right. Well, keep, if, if it means that you keep, if you don't go out and you keep making this music, stay inside. No, but we're going to get, we got a thing, just so you know. Um, uh, I put together a band called Super Soul Band, B-A-N-N-E-D. And it's an instrumental band, horn band. And um, I, I put the band together because I work uh, with Michael J. Fox and Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, and they have a gala every year. And they asked me to put together a band several years ago to entertain and then back up a major artist that they have. And so I put together a band with some unbelievable people in it. Uh, Ray Parker Jr., Willie Weeks at the time, you know, uh, Isaiah Sharkey, who plays guitar with D'Angelo and John Mayer, uh, Wayne uh, Cobham, the trumpet player Eddie Allen, Clifton Anderson, yeah. Clark Gayton, and it's a fantastic soul band. And part of the repertoire was early Cool in the Gang, my favorite period of Cool in the Gang. So a friend of mine, Troy Germano, who owns Germano Studios, he was working at Germano Studios, and he said, look, uh, Ronald Calise Bell is going to be down in the studio. I know you want to come see him. You haven't seen him in a long time. Come on down. So I went down. And we, we hooked up, and he started, I said, look, I got this band, and we're playing all your old stuff. I know you don't play anymore, but it's bad. You got to check it out. <laughs> and so we invited uh, Ronald to play with us uh, at one of the gigs, and he got hooked. I'm hooked. So he's in the band now. And I'm in the band. And he... And now dig this, dig this. He wrote us a song. <laughs> Gotta get up <clears throat> on the jam, take it higher, bump into the super soul band. Now this man writes a hit, he's a hook master. Now all of a sudden he's writing songs for us, so we haven't recorded it yet, but I, this is like a dream, come true. this is like the Twilight Zone. I mean, I was like, I was like, you know, you, we're going to play some of you also. Now he's writing new material for us. So this is great. So maybe in a year or so, you might hear this song and some other songs speaking of the passion of just keeping stuff going, you know. The, and that's how things happen, you know. Th that's how a collaboration can take place. You have somebody that you've always admired and you, and, and you make contact and you never know what's going to happen. And now we have this thing that, and it's just... Yeah, we're it, all in. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's like we, and, and the other person in the band, which I neglected to mention, is Mixmaster Mike, the DJ, who's the Grandmaster DJ for Beastie Boys and everything. Yeah, like. It's a whole other element to the band. And it's, it's amazing. Um, and uh, so you'll be hearing yeah. from us at some point soon at a, at a theater near you. 